Having developed an expression for the first order correction to uh, our coefficient CK, we are now in line to answer our original question, which was F at time T naught. So right before our perturbation was turned on, our quantum system was in some, in some state cat I. We were interested in the probability of being in a different state cat F at some time T larger than T naught. Okay, so we're, uh, we're looking at the situation where there was a transition from some state I to some state F. So they're not equal to one another. To do this, we solve the Schrodinger equation, uh, assuming we could write the state as a linear superposition of the stationary states of our time independent Hamiltonian to take into account the time dependence of our more general Hamiltonian we injected our coefficients with a time dependence. This led to a series of differential equations that we found we could solve uh, for a small perturbation if we took a perturbative series expansion of our coefficients. Then uh, by solving for these coefficients in iteration, we could in theory completely solve our problem. In the last video, we looked at uh, solving up to first order. And remember that the importance of these coefficients is that the square modulus will give you the probability of being in some state n at some time t. So these coefficients are central to answering our original question. We looked at uh, a particular initial condition where at time, uh, at the beginning of time, so at time t naught, we were in some state i because CN zero, our zeroth order correction was time independent. This left us with the, this value for CN zero. And we also had a, uh, a general expression for the first order correction, uh, this CN one over here which was so, uh, e to the i, this is an n, this is a k t. Uh, Okay, so in the context of this equation where we want to find the probability of being in some state f, then since we're assuming that these two are different states, then this zeroth order correction to cf is zero because this will be Kronecker delta of F i. Since F is not equal to i, this is equal to zero. And in general, we would have the following expression. Okay, so this we said was equal to zero. And we're only we're only gonna look at up to first order. Okay, so the interest of this is the probability of starting in state I and ending in state F, which will denote by this curly P subscript IF at some time t, this is equal to the square modulus of CFT. So this is the probability of being in state F at time t. 
uh, since this is equal to zero, then up to first order. And uh, taking lambda to one, so turning on the perturbation entirely. So up to first order, we have that the probability of being in state F is the square modulus of this quantity over here. Okay, so this is the solution to our original problem. And it all comes from the interpretation of these coefficients that their square modulus uh, gives you this probability of being in a particular state at some time t. And again, this is our expression for first order. If we wanted to, we could go on to second, third and fourth order, etc., and get a more refined uh, result. Okay, uh, this quantity here, delta H F I, this is um, the perturbation matrix element, which you can think of as uh, coupling the two states I and F. So this perturbation will connect these two in some way that it will allow a transition from state I to state F with some probability. All right, so in the next video, we'll go through an, an example of how we can use this equation uh, for the case of a one-dimensional harmonic oscillator exposed to a time-dependent perturbation. And we'll look at what the probability of uh, that oscillator transition from one state to another during some time uh, is as given by this equation.